Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 733. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 24th, 2022. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you can uh, join us if you're viewing or listening on a podcast. If you are new to the program and didn't know we have a podcast, you can find the link in the show notes to the podcast. Uh, if you want, please like us. It helps with the algorithms at YouTube and Facebook. It makes us more popular because we're not popular. We're just infamous. And if you want to share this with your friends and family, please share. But the show really continues after we're done with the recording in the comment section. We get lots of comments for each episode. We appreciate it. We read each one. Sometimes we respond to the comments. Please participate in the comment section after the show. Uh, George, well, did I mention I'm in Wisconsin yet? Oh, no, okay. no, you so, haven't. Oh, no, no. I've taken Sasquatch our, our RV from Florida. We stopped in Red Bay, Alabama, and got some upgrades, got some new couches and stuff that needed it. This is an older Tiffin, not a brand new Tiffin. And now we're up here in Wisconsin to visit mom and dad and family and friends for a couple months. And I went from 85, 90 degree humid Key West to 61 degree cold Wisconsin. And I will never tease you again about wearing your parka when it's 75, George. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit chilled here, but I, in my defense, everybody at the campground is also wearing parkas, hats, and gloves. It's just a, it's a little uncommon cool, uh, coolness here uh, in, in Wisconsin time. So how are you doing, George? Well, I've got, well it's, I, my thermostat is it's set at 78, and I've got a jacket on that tells you how thin my blood is. But it's going to go up to the mid-90s today. Mm -hmm. Kevin, I was looking at the weather for our county, and you live in a neighboring county, yeah. and we've had some rain pass through, and Webster had six inches of rain uh, this past few days. So you uh, got I, out in time. I did. I got out in time, and we avoided some tornadoes in Alabama, and uh, we got rained on going through uh, Kentucky. We stopped in Paducah for the night. A lot of fun. All right, before we bore everybody, let's get on to the news. And I have to change my Facebook status. Marked safe from monkeypox. Click. There we go. So I don't have it. You don't have it. But uh, there's a, a new thing going around. COVID's old. Uh, election news is old. Trump is old news. Monkeypox is the new news, George. And uh, um, yeah, just thanks. Thanks for something else. Well, actually, Kevin, you and I, and basically everybody above a certain age, should be protected, because you know I had a smallpox vaccination when I went before I first went to Africa. I got um, my yeah. And smallpox vaccinations prevent the monkeypox. It so this time around, if it's if it's going to be bad, it's going to affect young people because smallpox has been er eradicated. They don't give smallpox vaccinations as. Uh, matter of course mm -hmm. so you and I will be fine it's just our children's generation um, and there's also reports that it's being passed around uh, through uh, transmission uh, sexual transmission of this new latest outbreak mm -hmm. so it's essentially monkeypox is the latest <laughs> sexually transmitted disease oh, which we're too old to worry about I anymore don't. anyway I'm so. not worried about that no wow so yeah it's it, it's something else it's crazy you know i i proclaimed on facebook it's one of the seven seals so you know uh, you, you just you, you want to take a, a time and just sigh and say when is this news going to stop when is the world going to be less crazy and uh, so far that's not happening that's why we have a, a firm belief in uh, uh christ and he is the one who takes away our anxiety. George, turning to the news. Top of the news is Church of Scotland in my story uh, uh, outline. What are we going to talk about there? Well, their General Assembly met yesterday, mm -hmm. and by a vote of uh, 274 to 136, they've authorized same-sex marriage for the Scot Church, in Church of Scotland, mm -hmm. which is the Presbyterian Church. 
They're following the Scottish Episcopal Church, which two years ago authorized same-sex marriage. Now, it's the same, it's the sort of thing the Episcopal Church has done. You're not forced to do it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this is, the Presbyterians in Scotland are now the largest denomination to have embraced gay marriage as part of their liturgy and their rights. Um, I'm not surprised by this. Uh, the, the chatter in the newspapers that are sort of un, uh, unknowledgeable about the state of play of religion in general are that, well, the Church of England is next and may very well be. I don't yeah, know. I, I don't. But, uh, this is, Scotland is a very different place than England. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll, we'll see how things play out. But we certainly will see defections to the Free Church of Scotland, which uh, broke away a hundred plus years ago over liberal conservative issues. And we'll see that now happen even more strongly as parishes quit the Scottish Church of Scotland and either become independent or join the Free Church or another group uh, because they can't be in the same uh, camp, tent, under the same tent as those who say that uh, same-sex marriage is a moral good because their answer is who, who rewrote the Bible? When is when was Christ wrong, and now you're right? So, no, I, well, I, my, I'm not surprised by the news, and you're right. The Church of England is different than the Church of Ireland, the Church of Wales, Church of Scotland. Um, they all are are certainly liberal churches, but you know, Church of Scotland's leading the way in this, and uh, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, well, we, I guess we saw what happened. Uh, Calvin Robinson is in the news and he wrote a, a a good story he's been responding to uh the news he's a television uh personality in england he's also somebody uh on the ordinance tract and uh he's making the news because he's certain that the church of england is not systemically racist and that the uh society of england is not or the uk is not systemically racist quite a story there george yeah, uh, Calvin Robinson is a, a media personality, uh, intelligent uh, young man in his 20s who appears regularly on GB television, which is a fast-growing news channel, sort of akin to Fox in okay. its sort of viewership, the, the sort of people who would watch it. And he also was training for ordination uh, in the Church of England. And he completed his training and was set to be ordained a deacon, and he was going to continue as a bivocational deacon. Uh, meaning he would keep his day job and work, you know, part-time at a parish in London. Well, he was told that, uh, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to ordain you. And he had a meeting with Sarah Mullally, the uh, Bishop of London, who said, you know, Rob Wickham, who's the Bishop of Edmonton, which is one of the areas within London, is very concerned about your tweets where you're tweeting that there is no such thing as institutional racism or systemic racism and that you reject the uh, claim of uh, you you denigrate the BLM movement mm -hmm. and you are you're just a conservative and your views really make you unfit and I, I Sarah Mullally need to tell you that the Church of England is systematically racist and that you just don't know any better. Now, what we've not mentioned so far is Calvin Robinson's black. He's a, he's a young, articulate black man who is the wrong sort of young, articulate black man for the Church of England. I guess the, Bishop of, London, the Bishop of London has revealed herself as racist. Yes. Okay. But this is ridiculous, George. Well, Calvin uh, took to the newspapers, and there were stories in the Times, the Telegraph, the Daily Mail, on media, basically showing up the Church of England to be utter fools, mm -hmm. that you've got middle-aged white woman telling a black man uh, what is racist and what is not racist. Now, Calvin wrote an article for the Daily Mail, which we republished in Anglican Inc., where he said, yes, I've experienced racism in my life, but that was from a few cranks or disaffected uh -huh. individuals. Yeah. Um, how 
tell me I live in an institutionally racist society when here I am, a young man in his 20s, and I've got a TV show on a news channel. And it's yeah. based, in other words, his merit took him to where he was going. He wasn't helped along by his race. In fact, he's found as a conservative, he's been hindered by his race, not by conservatives, but by liberals yeah. who say he's the wrong sort of black guy who doesn't think the way he should. He should get back on the plantation and do and say what his white masters say, yeah. who are liberals. Well, the story's taken another step recently. Calvin has announced he's quit. The Church of England is joining GAFCON. And how, he's going oh, to be how, ordained... Wait, how, how can he do that? He's going to be ordained a deacon in the Free Church of England. Okay. And which is a bit of a stretch because that he went to St. Stephen's house right. and he's a conservative Catholic Anglican. He's opposed to the ordination of women, uh, so on and so forth. He basically is a forward in faith USA type mm -hmm. of Anglo Catholic. He'd be perfectly at home in Fort Worth, uh, places like that. Free Church of England was formed as a protest against the Anglo Catholic movement. So, I don't know whether this is just a temporary landing spot so that he can be ordained and then, but being a member of the Free Church of England, he's a member of GAFCON. Um, and we'll see where his career takes him. Sure. He'll have a church in North London. And because of his skill set, his skill stack, if you will, I expect him to have a thousand people on a Sunday pretty quickly because he's so dynamic. He and whatnot. But we'll just need to see what the long haul has. Is he the next Wesley? Is he going to set the world on fire? Or is he... How much depth is there to Calvin Robinson? And I'm hopeful that this may be one of the tipping points uh, for the reform and renewal of English life. Yeah, we'll have to see. All right, so uh, next story is a really sad story out of Nigeria. And you remember Sam and Rushdie, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, he spoke out in a book about uh, Muhammad, and he was uh, uh, put under a threat of death by uh, the leaders of uh, a couple of radical groups of Islam, and had to go in hiding for many years. And he, I think, he's finally out of hiding about a dozen years ago or so. Um, because well, no, not not radical groups in Islam, but by Ayatollah Khomeini. I mean, by himself, mainstream yeah. Islamic okay, leaders. Sorry, and I find him to be radical, but okay, <laughs> the the late Ayatollah. So, um, in as such, there's been a consternation within the press and within society about talking uh, bad or talking in any way about Muhammad. Uh, or drawing cartoons about Muhammad or drawing uh, uh, any images about Muhammad because there is that threat of death. And we see here in Nigeria that that threat really still exists. A, uh, a student from Nigeria was stoned to death this week, George. Deborah Samuel was a student at a university in Sokoto, which is in the northern Nigeria. It's one of the Muslim-majority states. And she was on a either Facebook or WhatsApp, a social media group with other students and the topic turned to religion and she said i'm a christian and i believe muhammad is wrong and that jesus christ is the way the truth and life well she goes to school the next day and some of the muslim students on that facebook group laid wait for her and attacked her and stoned her to death and then burned her body and this was all filmed by uh security cameras and the university security people didn't step in the police didn't step in she was martyred for her Christian faith and stoned to death for blasphemy against Islam. And then the police began to act when Christian leaders began to protest. And then riots broke out where Muslim youths then sort of protested across the city. Christian worship had to be shut down that Sunday in Sokoto for fear of death. And the army's been called out and the order's been restored. But this has been, well, it's a horrible story for a person's death and martyrdom. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is also a story that has grabbed Nigeria and its Christian population and says, hey, wait, this is 
this is just beyond this is too much yeah, the police too stand by yeah. mm -hmm. it's on videotape the two people you know the two ringleaders have been arrested and what are they charged with disturbing the peace you know this is evidence of the government's either indifference to christians or hostility to christians so the Deborah Samuel, uh, this past weekend, there was a national inter national Christian interdenominational prayer service led by the Ch Christian Association of Nigeria in Abuja, where some very strong things were said about the failure of the government to hold uh, the lives of Christians dear. I mean, we've had continuing deaths by Christian farmers out in the countryside by a Fulani Muslim tribesmen. We've had death, you know, Boko Haram and uh, the Islamic State. But now, I hate to say it, but it's almost like now it's getting personal. Where they're killing yeah. schoolgirls for confessing faith in Jesus Christ. And so this this may be the start of something big. Well, we, just, we have to hope so because, know. you know, we have saw it divide Sudan and other countries. Um, and there's been so much violence in uh, East Africa, it's time. Yeah, it's time for change. On to our next story, and it's really about accountability within the church. You're gonna say, "Well, how can Nancy Pelosi, a story about her, be about accountability with the church?" Well, her bishop said, "You can no longer take communion because of your views and uh, leadership in the uh, fight over abortion." And the bishop's archbishop says, nah, she could take communion here in Washington. I don't, I, is he the archbishop or the bishop? Her bishop? I don't know. No, no, that's no. right. That's right. But if she goes to church in Washington, you're welcome to have a communion here. Lack of accountability, George. Well, abortion's a sin in San Francisco and in Catholic churches, but not in Washington. Yeah. Uh, that's a flippant remark, but yeah. Archbishop Cordelone the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of San Francisco, said Nancy Pelosi, who's the Speaker of the House of Representatives, one of the leading politicians, leaders of the Democratic Party of the United States, keeps saying that her Catholic faith, her Catholic understanding of life, informs her decisions on abortion. And that's why she thinks abortion at any time, for any reason, is a moral good. Archbishop Cordelon said, look, this is not Catholic teaching. You're holding yourself out as a Roman Catholic, saying I'm that you are following Roman Catholic practices. You're not. Until you recant or repent, you may not receive Holy Communion. I'm repelling you from the altar. Wow. Wilton Gregory, the Archbishop Catholic Archbishop of Washington, D.C., says, no, we're not going to repel her. No, she's free to take communion whenever she wants. So we've got a divide within the Catholic archbishops of the United States of some basically making a stand and saying this is the moral teaching and doctrines and others saying, well, whatever floats your boat, man. Uh, you, you know, Joe Biden is famous for saying his Catholic upbringing teaches him that abortion is a good thing. Mm, I think he's a little confused there, yeah. Joe. And Let's well, go through the catechism. Actually, politically, politically speaking, Joe, Joe Biden flipped on abortion yes, he did. about 15 years ago. He had been strongly anti-abortion based on his Catholic beliefs. Mm -hmm. But when the Golden Ring appeared to higher office, he became pro-abortion and now is sort of stuck in that line. So the Catholic Church, the Catholic archbishops in the United States are basically issuing contradictory rules and interpretations and the Vatican in Rome has chosen to be very silent about this, and it's not offering any direction. They don't want to get involved. Which is interesting, because they were involved in a few controversies when Trump was president. Uh, they spoke out uh, about some stuff. So they're holding back here because they're fine with it. They don't care. As far as I'm concerned. That's what I see. Uh, oh, boy, this is kind of a personal story. But... Uh, um, there is a retired pensioner uh, rector from, is he, he's from the UK, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Stephen Sizer is uh, being held uh, accountable within the church. And I thought we could talk this, but let's not talk about the personal side, George. All right. 
Uh, Stephen Sizer, who's a retired priest of the Church of England, is facing a disciplinary hearing this week in London, where he is accused by leaders of the Jewish community, the Board of Deputies of British Jews, for of conduct unbecoming a member of the clergy, specifically 11 counts of anti-Semitic actions, utterances, behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, Sizer is a very famous pro-Palestinian activist and five years four or five years ago he was silenced by his bishop he couldn't go onto social media for six months because of his statements about Israel and the board of deputies basically said look this guy's a holocaust denier this guy appears on the same platform at stages with holocaust deniers Hezbollah speakers um, this has got to stop where this man is basically promulgating hate. Uh, and this trial this week, we'll see if these, if anti-Semitism is actionable in the Church of England. Well, words, my question, if, if he's a pensioner, if he's a pensioner, what authority do they have over him? Well, financially they have none because he's getting his pension. They can yeah. pull his license and say you can no longer take the occasional service. Mm -hmm. And if his his sacramental life is important, that's a threat. But literally beyond that, they can't fire him because he's retired. Yeah, uh, they they would not defrock him. I just don't see that being within the realm of possibilities. Mm -hmm. They would basically say stay off of social media for six months a year keep your mouth shut about israel tweet about what you you know take pictures on instagram of what you had for dinner don't talk about israel don't talk about the jews don't talk about who you think is responsible for all the evil in this world he may do it he may not do it but you know you really you know kevin now that you've been in florida long enough you've seen the <laughs> phenomena of old men gathering at McDonald's around 7.30 in the morning with their senior cup of coffee, complaining about life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We don't worry about what these guys say. They can talk about kids today. They can talk about the government. They can talk about whatever they want. They've reached the point in life when they're free to complain and be a cranky old man. I think the Church of England has to decide at what point is a priest free to be a cranky old man versus following the party line. Well, I'd say it's where the influence would come. You know, how much per influence does this person have? And is he bringing uh, a bad light on the Church of England? Can you bring further bad light on the Church of England was another question. So, I don't know. We'll have to we'll see and how that story remember, plays out. Remember, folks who are being paid by the hour to watch this, we are reporting allegations, allegations. of anti-Semitism. Yes. We have no first-hand knowledge, and we have not concluded anything. Allegations. Allegations. All right. Alec Cameron's coming up in news. Uh, just, you know, because he was involved with the previous diocese, we didn't know anything about this. What's, what's the story there? Well, it's spelled Alex, but some of our viewers tell us it's Alec, pronounced with I a C. So we'll trust him. Yeah, Alec. Try I've not it. met the guy. Well, I'll trust him. Yeah. He is was a recently elected bishop of Pittsburgh on the first ballot. That was a big surprise, first mm -hmm. ballot election against a strong suit of candidates. Well, he was leading the, I guess you call it, executive committee of the Diocese of the Upper Northwest, um, which its bishop, Stuart Rook, has been on a sabbatical while he's being investigated over... Uh, charges that he did not handle an abuse situation well right and now that uh, alec is going from uh, the upper midwest pittsburgh uh, there's been a transition of leadership at the top of the upper midwest now the diocese of the upper midwest it's in tough times. Yes, it is. Uh, recently, uh, the mother of one of the vic alleged victims, uh, I say alleged, not that I doubt it, but rather because it's not been adjudicated yet in the court of law, the criminal proceedings have not yet taken place. Uh, the fellow who's in jail, Mark Rivera, 
is in jail awaiting trial on child I, rape. I, I heard he's been released and he has a brace, uh, ankle bracelet. Okay. okay. He's awaiting trial nonetheless. Mm -hmm. um, one of the mothers of his victims has sued the Upper Midwest and the ACNA for damages for mm -hmm. failure to respond appropriately and adequately. We're for now, according to... I went to the county website, to the dockets, to look up this lawsuit and mm -hmm. because I saw an article in the Religion News Service and I couldn't find anything on the docket. So they may just have not gotten the paperwork uh, online yet. So I really don't want to comment too much because I'm just repeating secondhand information rather than having not read the docket. Yeah. But I wonder, but they're only asking, according to the news summary uh, by Religion News Service, for 50000 in damages, which, you know, in light of the Catholic abuse trials of millions upon millions in damages seems pretty cheap i mean i i would actually settle uh make because you pay that much in a retainer to a, a lawyer to defend yourself yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was an odd amount uh, i i do have to agree with that so we'll have to see what happens but there yeah upper midwest has now got these expenses of litigation the expenses of, of, uh they could be you know they've got to pay for these investigations and it's not a wealthy diocese um where it has just cash lying around these things can bankrupt a diocese it doesn't have to be millions you know fifty thousand here fifty thousand there if you're a new diocese that can yeah. knock you out well so i we'll am see what happens i'm currently in that diocese and i'll be visiting uh uh, upper Midwest churches uh, for the next two months. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep you informed of what's really happening on the ground here. Um, I don't know how we pronounce uh, new. Uh, oh, Tessim has a new uh, dean. I thought we could talk about Brian Holum. I think so. That's how you pronounce it. Holum? Yeah. Yes. Uh, he's a young guy, meaning he's younger than you and I are. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so everybody's young. He's a kid. Uh, Oh, I've reached that stage in life where we're talking about people now younger than we are. Oh, it's terrible. Um, he will succeed Laurie Thompson as the Dean and President of Trinity Seminary in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Don't know the fellow. Uh, all I know is what was in the press release, but he looks young, energetic. He's got a great resume, PhD. Um, Praise God that, and I pray that uh, the right person, the right guy, has been found to lead the seminary into the next century. Well, I think under Lori Thompson, you know, Tessin really sprouted and uh, got a, a good foothold on how to handle uh, the Episcopal uh, Act of Wars, how to uh, you know, be a leader in, you know, evangelicalism type seminary. And, uh, you know, it was, it was nice to watch that. To me, it's a little sad, though, because the ACNA and the Episcopal Church are now developing their own traditions and differences. A little bit, yeah. Uh, see, Laurie Thompson supervised my parish placement 27 years ago. Wow. Uh, for two years, yeah. I was his, basically, seminary and assistant. Mm -hmm. So I know Laurie very well, and our paths diverged. He became a mm -hmm. seminary dean. He left the parish in Connecticut, and I've gone my way. But those sort of, we're seeing the passing away of the interlapping of uh, Anglican and Episcopal links mm -hmm. as each develops its own tradition. So that's a bit sad for me because, uh, I, as I said, I don't know the fellow, whereas uh, maybe a generation, 25 years ago, I would have because it's really a small world in the Anglican world. Sure. All right, let's move on to Lambeth 2022, 23, 25. There is a Lambeth coming. It was recently canceled because of COVID. And you and I wanted to know who's going to be invited, who's getting the invitations, who's not. And we were surprised by who was invited. And uh, we were, oh, is GAFCON going to be invited? Or is the ACNA going to be invited? More ACNA than GAFCON. And we heard that Foley Beach was invited but maybe more as a viewer than a participant. What's the story, George? Well, Foley Beach was, 
was graciously offered observer status, like he was in the Salvation Army or maybe a Muslim or something. And he has, again, graciously declined that invitation. Uh, this has been out there for some months, but it's sort of come to a head recently because the uh, Welby and company has been saying that, you know, we're all walking together and uh, we're agreeing to disagree and it's our diversity is what unites us. You know, what? Tro trite like that. I don't, I know, I know, I know. Uh, our diversity makes us stronger. It doesn't make us weaker and all this and that. Well, Foley Beach put out a statement uh, this past week that was first reported by the English Churchman, a newspaper in the UK. And he said, no, we're not walking together. Nigeria, Rwanda, Uganda, and I, uh, we are not going to the Lambeth Conference because we do not agree with Justin Welby's argument that different understandings of moral teaching are second order issues because we read quite clearly in scripture that those who engage in fornication and ungodly acts will not go to heaven and if the church is in not only if the church is closing a blind eye but also encouraging people to engage in sinful behavior the church is violating the clear words of christ on these issues so the uh no, we're not going to go along to get along. And that's why we're not going to land. Oh, pretty interesting. Uh, now, you and I, did you ever yeah. get uh, an answer to your request for accreditation? I was accredited by, by Lambeth. Um, and thank you uh, for accrediting my accreditation. How do you call that? Uh, so Anglican TV Ministries, uh, our cameras are uh, permitted to go to uh, press events at the Lambeth. Now, will we go? I don't know if it's worth the money if Gafgon's not going to be there. Uh, all the interesting people, Nigeria, Uganda, uh, aren't going. Why would I go? I don't know. Yeah, and if it's going to be as a controlled, uh, if it's going to be like a Soviet party conference where the bishops all clap in unison, you know, after the great speech is read by the dear leader, it's not yeah. worth going. I, want, uh, I do want and, a picture of a blue tent. Oh, uh, a, a blue, blue tent that's been paid for this year, uh, rather than uh, than not. But uh, last Lambeth conference, they uh, were so proud of their financial acumen. Then they forgot that they owed a quarter million pounds or whatever it was dollars for the marquee tent that they used for all the proceedings. So Oops. It was rather silly. Well, last time I was there, th they were having a heat wave. Mm -hmm. um, we were there for the the, the famous UK heat wave. And uh, we, I was stuck at the uh, Kent University dorms. I, ha I was at a third floor, all steps, in a brick building. It was, you know, a couple hundred years old. And I just baked in that room where it was indoor temperature, 99. The little squeaky window wouldn't open up. The little flaps on the window. It was just miserable. But we got to hang out in the AC press room. And that's all. We just stayed there. So. The University of Kent... Uh in Canterbury is, was built in the 60s of uh, poured concrete and it's one of these ugly uh, was it Corbusier or yeah, one of the, it. this French architect who basically believed in the virtue of ugliness mm -hmm. and the way it was built was that uh, if the students would riot it's during the student riots time they had quadrangles where the police come in with the water cannons and uh, sort of control everybody yeah it's it's an ugly, ugly, ugly place. Yes, it is. Um, and, it is. and some oh of the dorms my. don't have AC, just to let you know. All right, so people remember Peter Old, who used to be on Anglican Scripted. Uh, he was a statistician, and he was very popular for bringing stats to our program. We have found another statistician, and you published an article on Anglican.ic. It's the lead article this week by John Heyman. And he discusses, through charts, numbers, and data how the churches the old church is slowly dying and sooner or later uh demographics meet doom and i thought we should talk about that george now, john is in a field i think you'd call mathematical sociology he uses statistics for soci sociological analyses mm -hmm. 
meaning he's much smarter than I am. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> he has an article, which is the lead article on Anglican Inc., and we're going to have a follow-up on his part two at the end of this week, because I want to give the first part good exposure, about statistical analyses of the churches in the UK. What does the future hold? And he has three conclusions. The first is that the uh, historic churches, maybe except with one exception, will be gone within 50 years because they're not reproducing themselves. Now, they're not, and, and that includes, so that some of them are going to be gone more quickly. The church in Wales has got 10 to 15 years. The Church of England and the Roman Catholics have 40 years. Uh, but in Wales, the Welsh Presbyterians, the Welsh Independents, the Church in Wales are all going to be gone within 10 years, 15 years. The Scottish Church in 10 to 15 years. Um, the Church of Scotland, we talked about at the top of this show, will be gone. And but, the only, and, but there will be some churches that will survive. And those churches are actually growing. One of them is a historic church, the Free Church of Scotland. Uh, and then the rest are new churches founded in, before, after the, the start of the 19th century, after the start of the 20th century. Sure. Uh, Pentecost, some Pentecostal churches, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, uh, the Vineyard Movement, they're growing and they're reproducing themselves. The, the second thing he found was that the reason why these churches are growing is that they put a conscious effort on conversion and attracting people, um, which is not true uh, in the uh, historic churches. They may pay lip service to it. They may talk about the decade of evangelism, but they don't do it. No, they don't. In the fact, I, I would tend to say that you're looking at churches who are following society and not leading society are the ones he's talking about here. Those who are, you know, society says, this is okay, well, we bless that as well. Those are the churches that are failing. The, and then the third point is, follows just along what you said, Kevin, is mm -hmm. that those churches that are thriving are those that hold traditional evangelical or conservative viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Now, the Church of England is maybe evenly divided on this point, so that's why it's sort of on the longer scale. Uh, but of, of decline compared to, say, the Scottish Episcopal Church or the Welsh Church in Wales. But it really, his analyses put into hard numbers what you and I have been talking about from anecdotal evidence of the past generation. Mm -hmm. We've talked recently about the Church in Wales. The Church in Wales uh, is... Its bench of bishops is hard left. It pursues a political agenda, and their response to decline is to add more bishops. The archbishop needs an assistant bishop to help him with all of his work to supervise the number of people, in, you know, that he should be able to handle in an afternoon. Uh, I'm being silly, but the the churches are more inter interested in institutional survival and appealing to the editorial opinion writers of The Guardian than they are to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, the Church of England will hold on longer because it's got money. Let's say the Church in Wales and the Scots Episcopal Church, they don't have money. So when they go, they're gone. Sure. And... and so what's the answer? Uh, is it we all join the vineyard? No, I don't think so. Um, well, I think they need to stop being institutionally racist. That's where you start, you know. <laughs> well, let, let's let's take London right now. London, yeah. you know, you've got Sarah Mullally, who's a rather uninspiring person. Uh, in other words, she's not somebody that can hold an audience of a thousand people uh, as they listen to each word come out of her mouth. Mm-hmm. She's now going to have to face a Calvin Robinson, a populist to her right. So everybody who doesn't, hasn't, doesn't want to be Catholic, who doesn't want to be a Baptist, is going to go to Calvin in London, 
whose church, who's mad at the Church of England, is going to go to the Calvin's church. And Calvin will kill her media-wise. Calvin gave a little Easter message. He's not even ordained yet. And he had a quarter of a million people viewing him on YouTube. Sarah Mullally's Easter message had a little over 200, 250 people. Quarter of a million versus 250. A young guy... In his 20s. Or non-ordained. Yeah. In his 20s versus the Bishop of London. Quarter of a million versus 250. What's that telling you? So she's got a populist who's black and conservative on her right. To her left, she has, if you will, the Martin Percy liberals. Martin Percy is the former dean of Christ Church who has done dirty by the Church of England. Uh, Martin, I don't agree with him on most issues, mm -hmm. but I do feel that he was a victim of a terrific injustice at the hands of the Bishop of Oxford, at the Church of England. I don't expect much from college dons. I, I've been to Oxford, I've sure. been in academic life, and they're basically children. Uh, you know, the fights in academic uh, uh, commons rooms are more vicious than any other fight because the stakes are so small. Yeah, but. Percy was hounded out with false charges and legal wranglings and basically bankrupted out of being dean of Christchurch. But he's got a lot of influential friends on the left in the Church of England. And after a decent silence after he resigned, he's now taken to the airwaves, to Anglican Inc., to Modern Church, two different places, writing about the hypocrisy and the mendacity and the stupidity of the leaders of a Church of England. So poor Sarah Mullally is getting it from left and right. Left calling her a stupid hypocrite who's just in there for institutional, uh, uh, institutional survival, and the right saying she's an apostate, stupid hypocrite who's in there for institutional survival. With those, is this a moment like in August 1914, when an assassin kills the Archduke and we, we march oh, wow. off. I don't world. think that's it. <laughs> Is this that moment? No. It could be. Yeah. Because we've got a constellation of forces that have not ever really been there before. We have I a genuine bona fide populist who can suck out the energy and the ready cash, not the inherited wealth, but the ready cash. And then on the other side, you've got the liberals with their knives out for the institutional leaders who did dirty to Martin Percy. It's a possibility because the, right now the Church of England's biggest problem is it's institutionally woke at all levels. Um, it now has more generals and colonels than uh, privates, and that cannot survive. And for the largest part, 70% of the Church of England is non-transformational. They are following society. They are blessing what society does. They're not taking a leadership role and leading society towards a transformational life with Christ. They're doing just the opposite. They're 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 fighting people uh, in their worst condition and saying that's okay, that's fine. Hundred plus at hundred plus years ago, there were twenty two bishops and twenty five thousand clergy in the Church of England. Today, I think they're like 100 plus, 111, uh, whatever. Ten, you know, half the number of clergy, three or four times the number of bishops. Yep. Plus the archdeacons and the diocesan women's advisor, race advisor, climate advisor, ecumenical advisor, all these people drawing full-time salaries, none of whom are bringing converts to the Christian faith. Um, the church has got money it's got billions in the church commissioners funds yeah but until they were all spent um i wonder how long the institution will be able to survive yeah and one of it, it's important that we talk about the church of england one of the most watched episodes of anglican unscripted is one i did with galvin uh, ashington where we called uh, the church of england a hoax church and he goes in and talks about all this. And I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. Um, you know, it's 
it's time that we really reveal this so there can be a revelation a revelation yeah okay a revelation a revolution within the church it needs to be rebooted it needs to be started afresh because um right now it's it's just dead seed in the ground nothing's happening well let's let's look at the players right now um the catholic church as a whole its leadership is not is not that really distinguishable from the church of england in its wokeness no there are it's weak and it also has the inherited uh baggage of being uh traitors and foreigners uh, i hate to put it in those terms but it's on english being catholic um within them though is the ordinary former anglicans who've become roman catholics that has the potential if it's managed right and if it's led right to spark a revival mm -hmm. we have uh the Free Church of England. Well, except for Calvin Robinson, I don't know if there's anyone else under 81 in its clergy. It has an age it, issue, yes. <laughs> it has an age issue, and it's sort of served its purpose. Its institutional skeleton is there. Maybe it can see a renaissance uh, with new leadership and new blood. We have uh, the Anglican Mission in England it's reached sort of a stasis right now where it has great individual leaders but it's not moving out of its ghetto if you will of uh, they have lots of planning meetings but not a lot of movement right now money is an issue for all these things mm -hmm. you need money to do some stuff but by the same token the holy spirit did wonders with the wesleys without a lot of cash mm -hmm. and I guess I'm saying is uh, this sounds very presumptuous of me, but whom will the Holy Spirit choose to re-evangelize and revitalize England? Will it be the Catholics? Will it be the Church of England? Will it be the ordinary? Will it be AMIE? Will it be the Free Church of England? Will it be something else? Certainly God's, God's plans are that all people shall know his love and glory. And I'm confident that one day you know, God uh, shall reign once again in the hearts of Britons. But who's going to be the who's going to be the agent the Holy yeah. Spirit's going to use? That I don't know. No, we don't. All right. What a wonderful program, George. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 730. Three. 33 of Anglican Unscripted.